I'd like to start by thanking you for being here. As Sokazan often does, just let you know that we really appreciate all the support you show through your contributions and your participation. There's a great deal, and I mean a great deal, that goes into keeping this functioning, operating up and running, just being able to continue to make these teachings available, let alone the maintenance of the building. So anything you can offer is always greatly received and appreciated. And again, if uh, nothing else, your, your greatest gift is your participation in these teachings and practices. Thank you for being here. It's so nice. This is the first time I've had a full screen of pictures, <laughs> and it's very, very nice to see you all. This evening, I'm going to talk about a topic I discussed with Sokazan a little bit earlier today, and I don't know why. I've been wanting to talk about topics that, that seem difficult, but I, I still feel inspired to talk about them. And this evening, I want to talk about fearlessness. The reason I want to talk about this is it simultaneously is a topic that can be incredibly inspiring on the path, but also easily misunderstood on the path. Oftentimes when we come to Buddhism and we come to meditation in the midst of intense suffering, Buddhism and meditation offers us some sort of opportunity. And because we can be coming out of very dark places, we grasp on anything that will give us some sort of support, some sort of encouragement on the path. And so this idea of fearlessness is very seductive. It gives us this idea, this image, this mentality of somebody who very confidently goes forward into the world and receives everything. But the root of fearlessness is the fear itself. And the fear is a tremendous... Um, opportunity on the path. And so fearlessness is not the absence of fear. And in fact, if we were to approach the path with this idealization of fearlessness and think that if I practice all this difficulty, this negativity is going to drop away, we would get quite discouraged. We would go in another direction very quickly because as we begin to sit, the fear becomes even more vivid. The difficulty the very things that we've been trying to pacify, we've been trying to smooth over, become more vibrant. The way Sokazan has talked about this before, it's not so much fearlessness, but seeing that the one who is afraid is unreal, so that the content of the mind, whether it shows up as seduction, shows up as fear, shows up as dis-ease, shows up as enjoyment, that content doesn't need to modify at all that the way in which we receive and what we receive through the sense six sense fields does not need any form of modification, but it is the way in which we relate to it. The solidity of the self that grasps on to these objects of the senses, the solidity of the self that grasps on to an object we call fear, an object we call hope, confidence, and security, is the area in which we need to look very closely. So when we are presented with an opportunity to consider fearlessness, the best thing we can do is to look at the very thing that is arising. It's not something that we pull out of a tool bag and we force onto our experience. It is the willingness to receive our experience precisely as it arises and all of its sanity and all of its insanity. And because this topic is um, it's, it's somewhat abstract or it feels abstract, we could talk about it a lot because there's a lot of ideas about it. I wanted to see if we could bring it into a more practical arena, which is why would this topic, why would this subject even be discussed in Buddhism and on the path? So fearlessness or fear as it arises, I think is an intimate part of every aspect of the path, starting with meditation. In a sense, meditation is our first introduction to fear because as we practice it, shikantaza, zazen, formless meditation, because we're not exerting ourselves out onto the world, we're taking an attitude of reception. The fear of meditation is that everything is welcome and that's very threatening. The practice of shikantaza is uh, if you really sit down and think about what Sokazan is asking us to do in meditation, 
It's terrifying. Because he's saying, don't get rid of anything. Don't exclude what's coming towards you. Don't grasp at what's going away from you. In fact, in as far as you're able to, don't do anything at all. And so you're very helpless in meditation because the content of the mind can take on ferocious forms. It can take on overwhelming forms. So meditation, the instruction of formless meditation, is a type of fearlessness that is completely intimate with the fear. And we don't have to get rid of that. Another very, uh, to me, a tangible example of this type of fear or fearlessness would be the intimacy of the three jewels. And it's the same thing if you consider it, if you consider the first jewel, the Buddha, that's incredibly threatening because we're not uh, just taking a historical figure that lived 2,500 years ago that we can feel good about and they saw something and they said a few things and they were profound. It is the immediacy of Buddha. It is the acknowledgement, even conceptually, even to consider the ground of basic goodness, that uh, if there is a Buddha, then there is only Buddha. And so our most difficult situations, the threat there is to have to look at that and see that that's not other than Buddha. It may not be synonymous. It may, may not be synonymous in the sense of how we grasp onto the form of it, but we can't abandon it because we don't think it's good. So that basic goodness, that inherent uh, sanity that we call Buddha nature, to consider that is threatening because there's always going to be individuals and situations which we feel are beyond Buddhahood. I think the Chisho, I think, helped us with the word for that, Ichantikas. We were perhaps saying it incorrectly. He corrected us as he would. Ichantikas, one that is turned their back on Buddhahood, still uh, Buddha nature. The Dharma similarly has a type of fear in it because it's a it's a paradigm shift of inclusion. It's it's a teaching that actually is intended to undermine the very uh, belief in an identity. So you're going into a teaching that's actually endeavoring to take everything away from you, at least in the sense of uh, solidity. In fact, you don't lose anything because there's nothing in particular to possess. I think there's a line like that from the precepts. And the Sangha. The Sangha is the one that perhaps is the most threatening because it takes all of these and takes it and makes it a living quality. The Buddha does too in the form of the teacher, but the Sangha does it in forms uh, of individuals that you have not chosen to be a part of your life, that you find a similar inspiration on the path, you acknowledge, recognize, relate to, study with a particular teacher. But so you have to actually put into action, in a sense, that receiving of whatever shows up in the form of a human being who is not your teacher. Sometimes it's difficult, but most often, having taken someone as a teacher, as most of us have with Sokazan, it's a little bit easier to give the benefit of the doubt. Not always very easy, but you've made a commitment, you've made an agreement, you've extended yourself and said, this is somebody who could help me see the truth, and I'm going to work with it as best as I can. But these other bozos following him, I'm not listening to them. <laughs> And the teacher has to act as or function as an introduction to that Buddha nature for all beings. And so the threat that there is Buddhahood, the fear that that could be an actuality, it's actually frightening to think that we could possibly see that. The Dharma that's endeavoring to point at that and that the, there's individuals that come together and embody that. So there's a tremendous amount of intimacy around fear and fearlessness in the three jewels and in the practice of meditation and in our own mind streams, the very content of our mind. 
when it's not personalized. I like the image so because I'm uses of watching clouds in the sky. It's it's a it's a peaceful image. It's a nice, it's a pleasant image. And I really like clouds. I don't know if anyone else does, like cirrus clouds and cumulonimbus clouds, and there's all sorts of kinds. But you would never go outside and scream at them. You would never go outside and say, I don't want cumulonimbus clouds, I want cirrus clouds, or why are you moving to the west? I want you to move to the east. And yet we do that with our own mind constantly. We can't relate to content in the mind in any other way except it's mine, it's wrong, it's right. And so you have this practice that's introduced to us to work with this fear, to work with this fearlessness. That is an attitude of seeing that nothing needs to be modified as far as the clouds passing through the mind. They may produce storms. They may produce beautiful scenery. And I think I felt inspired to talk about this because as I have practiced on this path for a little while, as many of you have, there's a type of artificial confidence that can come with familiarity. Where while we're very sincere and there's no doubt we're continuing to practice, we have begun to compartmentalize parts of our consciousness and, and forms of experience. And we've done so in such a way where we buffer ourselves from the very rawness that brought us to the path. And so I guess my intention is none other than to remind myself and perhaps to remind others that as we continue on the path, uh, these storms, these waves may continue to show up. And if we can return to that original intention, if we can return to that original abrasiveness that brought us to the path that we willingly have subjected ourselves to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, the teacher, the path, practice of meditation, if we can remind ourselves of that, then we can continue to include these storms as they come and go. We're not living up to an expectation. We're not accumulating anything on the path, which is iron ironic. I think Yu Dao could say something about that, the path of accumulation. Isn't, isn't that one of the five paths? You're doubting. I think it's first path. Um, I don't know how that fits into anything. Probably shouldn't have brought it up because it opens it up for questions. But so I, I guess tonight I would invite questions in this area of working with fear in all of the forms that it shows up in all the forms of prejudice we have against our mind streams, against the world, against feelings and situations and the way in which we can work with those in a very straightforward way through a path that in all its complexities is very simple. Is ignoring fear and proceeding anywhere fearlessness? Is ignoring fear Proceeding anyway, fearlessness. I think it perhaps could be if the awareness is primary. The ignoring of fear, especially if we're not doing that as a standard, because sometimes that is just the impulse. It's just ignore it and keep going. And we need to see that. But it's also not um, to be set up like oh, to, in order to be fearless, you have to ignore fear. You have to not have fear. You could actually have the fearlessness in the midst of the fear. Uh, that's how I understand it. And I, I come back to that idea of Sokazan saying that you just have to see the one who is fearful. It's not really about the fear or absence of fear. It's, it's more about the one that's strategizing their lives around the fear that shows up. I also wonder if ignoring fear is even possible. Like the parallel I'm thinking of is if I'm tired, I might just come to the cushion anyway, kind of ignoring the tiredness. But I wonder if fear is something we can ignore in the same way. It's a really good question. I I don't know. And I think it's probably individual. For me, it's not. I think similar to you, like I can ignore tiredness a little bit, but um, fear is pretty intense. I I think I can share this with you. I, I was in a, 
a 16 day solitary retreat this summer at um, the Black Stag where Sokozan and Uno live. There's a retreat hut out there. And I constructed a small platform. I'm, I have to confess something. I'm terrified of um, the dark and being alone. It's, I don't think I've ever shared that. I'm very afraid of being alone in the dark. And so I built this platform out in the woods and I was going to sleep on it. I was going to sleep on the platform um, for at least a few nights out of my retreat. I didn't make it through a single night. And there was no ignoring that fear. It was, it was so consuming. There was nothing I could have done to undermine that fear. And it didn't help when the coyotes started howling. It was usually at that time where I kind of packed up my cushion and said, well, maybe I'll try again tomorrow night. <laughs> but that's that's not a standard because for some people, it, it may be possible. Thank you. Andy. Andy Valley, is there a type of relationship to develop with fear? Yes, um, and it's it will not surprise you. It's the awareness. It's the beginning to have, and it starts with that intention that we're constantly reminded of. It is the intention to receive the fear precisely as it arises, and then to notice all of the iteration it takes, all of the iterations it takes spontaneously, meaning the fear arises and we explain it. The fear arises we try to look away from it. The fear arises. We try to talk ourselves out of it. So the relationship to me on the path as we're practicing is one of just simply being aware of it. And I think that's why fearlessness is misunderstood or maybe it's not misunderstood. Maybe it's just taught in different ways for different people because it's helpful. But I don't see it as an activity that's that we amplify. I think that the way Sokozan teaches it, it is the directness of the exact form in which it's showing up or the intention, you could say, is fearlessness or the willingness is fearlessness. But it is never, to me, it, it doesn't seem like it's at the expense of content, that fearlessness is not walling ourselves in or walling anything out. Andy Ryan. Is there a way to, I guess I'm wondering, perhaps you answered this already, but is there a way to go deeper into the fear? There probably is. And to me, the um, I am going to say it this way in this context, the most appropriate way to do that is with the teacher. And I feel that is because this this may sound silly, but in some way, meditation can be dangerous when you're probing the depths of, of fear and all of this unexamined consciousness. And so to have somebody to help us navigate that. So instead of just taking a, a warrior mentality or a stoic mentality and just barreling into it, to do it mutually in the context of the teacher and in the context of these forms the sitting meditation uh, that we do is probably enough for most of us. It's going to eventually begin to bubble to the surface. And when you find your resistance increasing or your impulse to step away, my feeling is to also do that within the context of the teacher, within the context of the forms. It's not like a touch in and hide out that you actually can relate to the entire situation as a form. Further questions, Mozuku? Oh, go ahead, Adriano. Uh, no sound. Let me check if it's on my end. <laughs> Could somebody else unmute and say something? You doubt. Oh, yeah, you doubted. Adriana, I don't know. No sound. If you if you get it figured out or if you want to type in um the question. I hear you. You hear me? I hear you. Good. <laughs> but I don't hear my friend Adriana in Florida. <laughs> it 
Is impatience a form of fear? A very good question. I think that we could talk about it that way. Impatience as a form of fear. I really, the other way I really like that Sokozanis talked about it is patience is waiting itself. It's not waiting for something. So if, if we're impatient, you could say that the very situation we're in is not enough. We're looking for something else. And that certainly can have a quality of fear. Um, in some cases, more traditional. In other ways, perhaps not as traditional. But yes, to answer your question, I feel like it can be. I believe you said earlier that fearlessness is not the absence of fear. So can you tell me again what fearlessness is? I I relate it strongly to the way Sokzan talks about intention. That it is it is the intention to be with all things. It is the intention to receive whatever arises. If fearlessness is the absence of fear and in its relative form it is, it's contrasted fear and fearlessness. Not that that's a problem and it's not that we couldn't work with some fears and see if we can't soften out the edges, but it's still a, a form of refining identity. It's still a form of refining personhood. And again, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. There are, uh, I've been working at <laughs> sharing all my fears tonight. This one's not funny, and so people need to stop sending me pictures of praying mantises. <laughs> um, so that's something I've actually actively worked with with Sokoza. I, I don't know why. They're absolutely a terrifying creature, and I grew up in the woods. I've handled rattlesnakes. I don't mind any of that, but there's something too humanoid about them. So it's okay to work with it, but when we bring that context or when we bring that concept into our path of meditation, we don't necessarily want to relate to our spiritual practice in the same way as shedding negativity or shedding the bad and retaining the good. Um, as the Heart Sutra says, without walls of the mind. So when you don't have walls of the mind, then there's no discrimination. We're no longer strategizing content we're just watching what is arising dependently what is sustaining dependently and what is uh, subsiding dependently so fearlessness to me is intention it is willingness it is uh, an attitude to be with whatever shows up including the fear itself in your mind so would fearlessness be something we can identify in ourselves rather than having it or would it be something that someone would say to us about our behavior you could say that you could identify it as an intention but you may not be able to identify it by defining it in the form of qualities and i think that meditation practice is perhaps one of the most intimate forms in which we can begin to identify that because just come back to the instruction we receive on a daily basis or coming out of the 108 meditation instructions or the meditation primer. You have a very clear and direct instruction. Hold still, senses open, whatever arises, regardless of how it looks, regardless of how it feels, is completely appropriate. That takes some form, some semblance of fearlessness that's not at the expense of anything. So conceptually you can identify that but again you are not necessarily going to be able to credentialize it that you can claim it you can point to it you can say because but there certainly seems to be an attitude in there in the practice of meditation and the practice of relating to the three jewels that requires some willingness to be uncomfortable a willingness to not just pacify or smooth over the rough landscape of our lives. Thank you. Mozuku. Mozuku Valley. In response to Andy, I'm not remembering exactly now, but you alluded to a danger in the practice and encouraged working with the teacher. Yes. What danger do you have in mind? 
Um, there's very concrete examples of this, and I I don't want to say it's uh, anyone's fault, but there are organizations that offer very intensive meditation retreats without guidance. And there's university studies about mental health issues after this, because if you sit still for a week or 10 days or 20 days, and you've never meditated before, and you just sit there and get consumed, you get snared by, you get drawn into the spinning consciousness that is arising. Um, there are people that have killed themselves. They've taken their own lives um, after doing these intensive meditation practices, or they, they find themselves dying out in caves of dehydration and exposure because they, they've created this idea of how to pursue the path. And so for the most part, meditation, if you're sitting a little bit here and there, or if you're, if you're doing some basic mindfulness, 15, 20 minutes a day, unlikely something like that is going to, to happen. But if you're exposing yourself to pretty intensive practice, which a lot of us are, I see a lot of you online on a daily basis, you know you're practicing a lot, the people that are living here are practicing a lot, you're going to confront things you've not seen before. And our impulses around them may be to work with them in such a way that doesn't help us see them, but actually fuels them. And that's where the teacher can come in and help us work with areas that are, are foreign or frightening or deceptive in consciousness. You also earlier said, if there is a Buddha, there is only Buddha. How is that the case? It's just something I've heard talked about in that way. Uh, similar would be if you see the Buddha in the road, uh, kill them. It's that if we define or confine or use discrimination to identify the Buddha, it only gets its identity as such because it's contrasted to everything else. And as I understand the teachings of the Mahayana and the teachings of the Buddha, that um, as Sokozan says, it's already the case. Sometimes he calls it our birthright. And so if there is one Buddha, if there is Buddha nature, that can't be contrasted to anything. So then there can only be Buddha nature. I don't think that's something we can cling on to or grasp on to intellectually, but it's to me, it's it, it provides some consideration when I look at the parts of my life that seem like they can't possibly be a part of this path to just flash on that idea of um, Buddha. Most of you dying, that's helpful. Um, with that, I think you said it would be, it's scary to the prospect of seeing that is scary. In what way is that scary? When we stop seeing it as what we idealize it to be, which would be for some of us more of a Hollywood image of a Buddha or even the ancient stories of Zen masters and tantric masters and, and arhats, it's pretty neat. It's like, wow, that sounds really wonderful. But do you really want to give your life over to the world? Do you want the world to live your life for you? I, something like that is, is pretty terrifying. The actuality of losing territory that you felt was so solid. So I think there is something a bit intimidating about really considering what it means to live out of the vow. Can't we just get to a point where, where it's good enough and we can just go live our lives and enjoy it? Everyone else can take care of themselves. They'll be okay. So yeah, I think there is something a little bit frightening about that. Oh, actually, I had another question, but yes, go ahead. Those are good bowing. You also said we can we start like when we've been practicing for a while, buffering ourselves against the rawness that brought us to the path. Yes. And you mentioned compartmentalization. Can you give an example? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Sure. Um, do you want a little bit of a personal one? Kind of, you've talked about this. You've been very open about work, your work situation. And sometimes that feeling that work is taking you away from practice. 
very natural. Of course, I was in the same position and I don't have a job anymore. I just do this. So it's pretty inspiring. But while you're in it, it's still something you, you relate to. It's part of the path. But there's still some resentment there. Um, I think another way that I do it and maybe others do that is when we cover up our experience with a slogan. We just repeat something we've heard Sokazan say or something we've read. And it makes us feel good. It's like, well, I'm just receiving. It's like, no, you're saying that so you don't have to look at what a shit show it is. It's like, just receiving. It's the one that I, I think I hate the most is, is it, it is what it is. People here don't say that so much, but that's a phrase that has always really grinded on me. It is what it is. And so I think we do that with Buddhism sometimes where we, we take something that's very raw and instead of just feeling it, we cover it over with a dharma. I know I, I do that and have done that. And as I've said, perhaps others can relate to a similar experience. Thank you. Further questions this evening? Yu Hong Baoing. Yes. In the beginning, I heard you said that the roots uh, of uh, fear is ourselves. It's oneself, if I recall that correctly. Um, what do you mean? Can you talk more about that? If that is the um, statement that I heard, Bao Ying? This may or may not be the one you're referring to, but I was referencing Sokazan and saying that you don't have to get rid of the fear, but you have to see the identity that is fearful. Is that what you're recalling, Yu Hong? Yu Hong Bao Ying, I think I'm more struck by the um the, the self and also i i uh, from a retreat i heard one of the stories i cannot uh, remember completely but one of the i think the master gave some um, participants uh, a court and then they put on um the all the participants put on the neck or something that they said that the actually this is uh, for um not for others, it's for you. Something like that is the the um is oneself, point to the oneself. I cannot remember the story completely. If you um I'm not sure I'm clear. Could you ask your question one more time? Yes. Um my question is who we are afraid of. Sorry. Who we are afraid of? Yes, is that ourselves? Bye. I don't know. It seems that the way it's talked about it is is somewhat of the root of that fear is is the is the fear of not existing or not being as solid as we think we are, and and that identity that that conglomeration that calls itself a self really will utilize anything to maintain that facade. And so I think the content of that fear changes from individual to individual. But um, as I was saying to Mozuku, it seems like that fear of realization itself is when we begin to, to, to look at the actuality. What does that mean? What does it mean to not, to, to not live for one's own gratification, for one's own uh, accumulation? And, and that's, yeah, that's not, that's not pleasant to the ego. The idealization is the idea we'd love to be selfless, but the actuality is serving others doesn't necessarily occur just when we feel like it. It's not just completely fueled by an emotion or a feeling or an identity. It's the situation. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Yuhong. Isaac Bowie? Yes, Isaac. What does a safe practice look like? You mentioned the dangers of practice that could show up. What is a safe practice, Bowie? I don't, I'm not really sure. Um, 
the Can form. The question? What is what I was talking about the dangers of practice, the the threatening qualities, and he's he asked, what does a safe practice look like? And I don't know fundamentally um, what that would be. I think that the context, the containers we have provide provide a safe environment to see what is very threatening. The containers of the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, the containers of a uh, practice community, uh, the containers of having a teacher allows us to look at what is very threatening or in uh, what can be very unstable in a way that is workable. Whereas without those forms, it may be more of what we talked about is dangerous, like relatively dangerous. Someone turned their camera off and then I lost you, Isaac, for a second. Had to find you again. <laughs> but the, the 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 path is threatening. The path is endeavoring us, endeavoring to get us to look at uh, the reality, which is going to contrast probably with our our, our ideas of what that is. A simple response would be, I think the forms in which we practice provide some structure, some safety so that we can look at this. Isaac Bowing, do I need to trust the forms, Bowing? You do not. You do not, and that's uh, not my teaching, that's Sokazan's. You don't need to trust anything, but you can give it the benefit of the doubt. I do think that you are coming, I believe, at the end of this month to receive Jukai. Um, there is there is a type of trust in that. There is some part of you that says, I, I don't know what this is, but I, I feel that I can see it, and I feel like I can do that for the benefit of others. So there's some sort of trust you could say in that, but you don't have to trust the forms, especially you shouldn't trust anything if it's at the expense of your own intelligence. It's very important that we go into the areas where maybe there's some skepticism and put some tension on that to give something the benefit of the doubt and work with it, even if we don't understand it. But it never needs to be at the complete and total expense of you can't ask questions, you can't, you know, you have to toe the line, you have to do this exactly this way. So the communication can still be there. There's still a mutuality. Uh, the mutuality doesn't mean peers. You know, the student teacher relationship is a very mutual relationship, but it does not it does not really mean that you're peers with the teacher, at least at least not initially as, as far as I can see. But it's still a mutual relationship where you you agree, you work together, you communicate. Barry. Uh, I have a question. Can we say that fear is a origin of other clashes? That's a good question. You could say that. Yes, you could say that. The one that um, to me shows up really at the root is ignorance. That it's it's through a, a fundamental misunderstanding that passion, aggression, fear, jealousy, pride tends to arise out of. But fear certainly can spawn a tremendous amount of prejudice. It can spawn a lot of aggression um, because you're afraid of it. So you just go right into fighting with it. You go into shutting down on it. So I think, uh, yes, I could go along with that. <laughs> And and the basic fear is fear of uh, dying, and it is egos that fear of dying. Yeah, can we? Can... I think that's that's a very uh, one of the biggest ones, and uh, might have been Ondo asked Sokuzan about that last night or the night before. In Zen, it's called the Great Matter. In Zen, uh, Zen Buddhism, the Great Matter is life and death. Uh, the the polarity, the dualism that seems to. Uh, be at the basis of all the other dualities. It's this fear that we're not going to exist at some point. Thank you. Thank you, Farid. Sanchu, did you have a question? Sanchu bowing. 
does fear indicate that that we're at war? No, uh, fear doesn't really indicate anything. Fear is dependently arisen. The indication arises through the positionality. The, the indication of fear arises through strategizing the fear. But fear is not uh, any different than anything else that arises dependently. It's just because it can be so intense. We feel uh, urgent. We, there's an urgency to do something about it. It seems that until we see that, then there's a lot of indications that there's fear when something is threatening our belief positionality, or there's fear when we don't understand something. But I think the, the way I, I'm looking at it or feeling is that it doesn't, doesn't really point to anything else. It's just fear arising. Jews on. Jews on my. Does fear indicate that we think there's someone? Uh, probably for me it does, but I also feel that when Sokazan talks about it, if you were to see through the self, it doesn't mean that fear stops. I know again to me the urgency around the fear is more the indicator of the positionality. It's, there are times, probably for all of us, where the fear is very simple very functional i don't know if i responded to your question thank you you hong how yeah. how do you uh suggest to work with the fear physically bowing um, physically do you mean like a, with an activity, like through the body? Could it be. And also you teach yoga. Like, you oh. know, could you talk a little bit how that can help us with work with peer, peers' body? Sure. I, I think in a relative sense, and I, I don't think there's anything wrong with well, relative well-being, that we, we can take small acts or gestures to just, so we can just continue. And yoga is a practice I teach and, and something I do that just can be an outlet, an expression of, of that uh, energy that allows us to work with it. If we want to go back into the suttas, there is a, the Buddha had a sutta called the Bhaya Bharava Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. This is the sutta on fear and terror. Read that a few times. It's pretty short. It's maybe three pages. But the Buddha's encouragement was if fear arises while you're standing, continue to stand. If fear arises while you're lying down, continue to lie down. If fear arises while you're sitting, continue to sit. If fear arises while you're moving, continue to move. So his encouragement, the way I understood that sutta was um, don't adjust what you're doing to modify the fear. That if fear is arising in as far as you can without torturing yourself, continue to be with that. And that's what I was doing out on that little platform in the woods. I was doing my best to lay in the midst of my fear, but the coyotes got the best of me. Um, this is a, a bit funny. Um, when I first went out there, it was very damp. There was mushrooms everywhere. And the property was swarmed with slugs. I don't know if I told you that. There were slugs everywhere. I couldn't, I had to like tiptoe on my walks. And when you're in the dark, I don't know if any of you have been camping, everything sounds like a grizzly bear, everything. Toad sounds like a grizzly bear. Bird sounds like a grizzly bear. So I thought there was something in the woods and it found out the uh, the slugs were making the dry leaves rustle. <laughs> I was afraid of the slugs. <laughs> I had, I'm sorry. I, I had that. I was camping in Minnesota one time on the Mississippi River and the same thing happened. And I pulled out a little knife and I'm like, there's a bear because there's bear lockers everywhere and black bears. And it was a toad. It was just rubbing against the side of my tent. I, I like ripped the tent open looking to fight a bear. It was just um, just a toad. <laughs> I'm very afraid of the dark. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, this is Chiazan, the prior at Sokokoji Buddhist Monastery. Sokazan offers these talks without expecting anything in return. 
If you value these talks and would like them to continue, please visit our donate page at www.sokukoji.org. Thank you.